the outside system doing anything at the moment. But I've just come off surgery, so it's just relatively, relatively fresh in my mind. Um, I'll try and keep it practical. I've, I've written this lecture because, you know, I started my first day as a doctor on call for surgery. And it was horrific. And I didn't really know what I was doing. So hopefully this will uh, heal that knowledge lack or lack of for when you when when you were in my shoes in sort of six months' time. Okay, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, common conditions first and all, and then we'll go on to sort of ward-based stuff that you'll see when you're on call. Um, you can break down the urinary tract into you know three different parts essentially, and you're going to get problems in all those. That is urology in a nutshell. Um, so I'm going to go through a few little, few little cases. They're not designed to uh, particularly uh, stretch you, but you will see what I've tried to make sure. You, you know, usually in these sort of clinical cases, you'll get barn door, barn door stuff. But you know, you'll get on the wards, you'll get really mixed pictures and strange clinical presentations. So um, you know, you'll, this this is a classic exam presentation, right? If you see sudden onset colicky, launch of groin pain, you know it's going to be a stone, okay? Um, you're going to, it's a horrible condition, seriously painful. Um, I do see you, don't choose it at, at, at uh, Jimmy's or the LGI if you're doing it as an F1, it's pretty dull. Um, I see loads of GP referrals for, for a queer renal colic, and basically, if they come in with this presentation, uh, loin to groin pain, hematuria, frank or microscopic, they will get a CTKUB. It's pretty much as easy as that. Don't worry about the distractors like being a diabetic or a smoker. They don't really have any in, uh, input into whether you are at risk of developing stones or not. So what would you make of these bloods? Anyone? Bacterial infection. Bacterial infection, okay. Uh, good, that's correct. So that's because you have a leukocytosis here with a neutrophilia. Normal hemoglobin erased CRP. Uh, your knees? <coughs> They're raised, okay. So, normal values, I don't think you're expected to know them for exams, but um, you will just pick them up just from day to day when you're faced with hundreds of stuff. So, yeah, it's, it's a raised creatinine, a raised urea. So, there's a degree of. Uh, <coughs> okay, yeah, degree of AKI, yeah. So, with that sort of picture, what are you worried about? Put it all together with the bloods. What could be going on here? Obstruction. Obstruction. Obstruction of pyonephrites, exactly. So we go into here, this is a um, this is a scan from the net, so everyone can see the stone here. It's really easy on the CTKB, just get onto the coronal section, you see it here. What you're looking for here is uh, looking up the ureters here, you're looking for evidence of swelling or hydronephrosis. In the reports you'll see things like dilated calyces. <coughs> There's no real evidence, they look pretty symmetrical <coughs> on either side. I, I quite like CGK UVs, they're a bit of my, uh, my geeky uh, forte because they, they just show everything, it looks pretty cool. Nice poo filled colon there, um, bits and pieces. So, this is a, a scan I took from today, one of my GP referrals. Here's the uh, transverse <coughs> section, you can see here, huge stone, that's bloody painful, 1.3 centimeters big. Uh, you can see the kidney here, huge hydronephrosis, the dil dilated calyx. Um, so go down here. So stones, okay. Um, complete contrast to your gallstones, which are mostly radiolucid here. They're really radio opaque because they're full of calcium, because calcium oxalate stones are your number one stone, okay? Even if you tell people to reduce your calcium in your diet, it's not going to improve the situation because your body will actually absorb more calcium if you reduce your oral intake of it. Um, so as I said before, in an exam, acute, colicky, loin to groin pain, anything colicky, yeah? Colicky pain is when it's in a muscular tube. You get colicky pain when you've got gastroenteritis, you've got colicky pain when you've got obstruction, you've got colicky pain when you've got a ureteric calculi like here. Why do you get hematuria? Because they're horrible little spiky stones that irritate your ureters and will, um, will cut them essentially. Okay, so we have the first chap, the first case, an erased white cell count. Um, because the stone sits there like a little oyster, like a bit of sand in your ureter, right? And all this like calcium oxalate will form around it. Um, and you'll get bugs just sticking onto it and growing, and you'll just get a development of infections there. Um, now, who can tell me what the diameter of your ureters are? What? Seven. Five. Yeah, well, 
you can make that inference using a nice sur surgery uh, reduction technique here. <coughs> it's going to be something like 4.5 millimeters, isn't it? So stones less than 4 millimeters generally pass. 6 millimeters are unlikely to pass. 4 to 5 millimeters, that's when you're calling a urologist. Um, when, I, when I see these patients, you always get a urologist uh, to see them. Uh, just a telephone opinion, so you're going to speak to them whether they, whether they want to see this patient or not. Generally, they aren't bothered if it's under five millimeters. They will just send you home with tamsulosin, which relaxes the smooth muscles of the ureters, 400 micrograms a day, and then um, you will give them oral analgesia, send them to this thing called Hot Clinic, which is like rapid access clinic. Well, basically, half the time they'll turn up and all the pain's gone because the stones pass, right? Uh, CTKEB, it's now the sort of definitive investigation for these stones. Don't mess about, just get a CTKEB. Um, that should be a first, first line answer in an exam. Uh, you may want to get an ultrasound KEB if they have multiple stones in the past, or they are pregnant, or they have any, any other risk factor, or they're young. So radiologists don't want to irradiate people. Because if you, I mean, a CTKEB has about a one in a thousand chance for giving you a cancer and not many people know, so you don't want to be irradiating 20 year olds at our age hundreds of times with CTs, okay? Um, urologists will then ask you if they've got a confirmed stone to get an x-ray KEB when, you, when they're in A&E, when you see them on the ward or whatever, mm -hmm. and then they'll ask for another x-ray KEB when, you, when they get to their clinic, so then they can see on the repeat the serial x-rays whether the stone has moved or has become impacted. So that's the reason for doing x-ray KEBs. Okay, can anyone spot the stone here? No? Oh, it's right there. <laughs> so that's like a, a nice spiky uh, calcium oxalate stone. And there is Wally, I actually found him earlier. Okay. So, where is the stone from the history? This is really good. This is, I was quite impressed when I was doing my research with this because uh, it'll tell you if you've got just loin pain, right? It's going to be an impacted stone at the pelvo ureteric junction, the bit where the kidney meets the ureter, okay? As soon, and then you'll see patients progress, you know, when they're sitting on CDU, they'll come in, oh, I've got a really sore back. And then they'll start moving down to their groin as the stone starts to migrate into the ureter. You'll get all, that's the worst part of the pain when it's in the ureter, so you get the associated nausea and vomiting with it. When it gets to the bladder, you're pretty much okay, because once the stone's in the bladder, it's, it's passed essentially. Um, you're going to get some stole suprapubic pain, a bit of hematuria, um, dysuria. I've only ever seen one patient in two, month, two and a half months now that's actually gross frank hematuria. It's mostly microscopic. Three plus of blood on a urine dip, and you're, you're thinking this is going to be uh, a stone. Okay. So, practical points here. So, you, you're going to get called to see these patients. You don't have to do many bloods, right? All you want to do, check they're not in AKI, check they've not got an obstruction, check they've not got an infection, get documented evidence that there is a stone, and sort them out some pain relief. That's all you need to do. Most of these stones are going to pass by themselves. Even if they've got stones in the, in the lower pole of the kidney, doesn't really matter. It's only when they, when they start migrating out into the ureters that's when they cause problems, okay? So you can have people who look like loads of little speckles in the bottom of their kidneys. That's all right, as long as they don't start migrating into the ureters. So what's urology going to do? If it's, if it's a big stone that's unlikely to pass and there's signs of obstruction, or it's a complicated stone when you've got pyonephritis going, they'll do an implantation <coughs> nephrostomy, okay? They'll put a, do an operation put a tube into the ureter so you relieve the obstruction and take the stone out. Okay? Lithotripsy is also used for smaller stones lower down. Okay? So here's a nice little uh, hydronephrosis. Um, the, the one on the left is a CT, the one on the right is an uh, intravenous pylogram. So can anyone spot here where the obstruction is on the IVP? <coughs> Okay, yeah, whereabouts though? Just in the pelvic, the, I don't know what it's called. Here? No, I mean on the patient's left. Alright, here? No, uh, at, the, at the, is it the ureteric pelvis of the kidney where it joins with the ureter? Here? So yeah, that's the on kidney the other here. side. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so, yeah, this really boggled my mind. 
okay, when I first saw these things. It looks like the instructions there, but it's not, because that is con it's dye, it's contrast. <coughs> so when you see contrast free flowing, here we have a degree of obstruction, probably here, because you've got a big hydroureter here and a dilated calyx. Okay? So this is a bladder full of contrast. If, if, if well, this is freely draining here, so you're not going to see much runoff here, it's being blocked probably by a stone here, and you've got a backflow. Here is a, remember that stone I showed you a few slides ago, the 1.3 centimetre one? This is the same, this is the same guy. Okay, so here we've got a huge hydronephrosis here. Right? And another one here. It's this guy bilateral renal stones. You see that's big. You wouldn't see that in a normal patient. And you can see the start of a stone coming here. One more slice down, you can see it. Pretty big. Okay. So, another sort of stuff you're going to see on acute, acute surgery, right? You're going to get called to see patients with an abdo pain. A lot of the time they're going to be old, they're going to be confused, they're going to be delirious, they're not going to give you a history, right? You're going to, have to see this guy, he's got a, a diffusely tender abdomen with a bilotable mass extended to the umbilicus, okay? Tachycardic, hypertensive, degree of AKI. <coughs> don't know whether that's new or old. So this is going to be... Retention. Retention. Okay, yeah, exactly. So, hydronephrosis, retention, it's going to be a post renal cause, isn't it? Okay? You're looking at a few things. You're looking for a stone, or you're going to look for a mass, either within the ureters, extramural outside of the ureters, or in males, you're going to get prostate, prostatic hypertrophy, which is going to be a big one. Okay, also prostate cancers. Get called to see these patients, do a bladder scan. Very easy, the nurse will do it on the ward for you. It'll tell you how, what the volume is. If you've got 500 mils, 600 mils, you've got a problem getting the urine out of the bladder, okay? So you can, in a, in a guy, it's going to be a prostate problem, okay? If they've got an empty bladder, the urine isn't getting to the bladder, okay? So you have to think of an obstruction higher up. So, how do you treat these? Stone in a nice phrase from the anaesthetist here. Put a cannula in, okay? Put a caster right down. This thing called a coup day tip, if you get asked in an exam, it's a good little tip for people with BPH. Coup day tip with an accent on the E. <coughs> this is a, it's like a caster with a little tip on the end of it, and it makes it really easy to get it, uh, a caster down for people who have enlarged prostates. Um, any budding surgeon out there will like that. In exam, you'll say do a PR, but you never do a PR really if you can help it. So, you know, when you're on the wards, you're not really going to do a PR. Stuff you'll find there is a We'll go on to a bit later. So always consider retention in elderly patients with abdo pain because if they can't give you a history, it's an easy thing to exclude and it really does sort people out quickly. They'll be in a lot of pain, they'll be post-operative, they'll be confused, they won't tell you much and uh, this is pretty, pretty, pretty easy. Okay, so the next bit we'll get just to talk about infections. This is pretty easy stuff, we'll fly through this. Okay, 24 year old female, Everyone knows what this is going to be, it's going to be UTI. Young females with lower urinary tract symptoms and a positive dip is going to be uh, UTI. It's going to be likely to be cystitis. Coliforms are the most common bacteria in, in, in females. It's fecal contamination, it's E. coli. Make sure they're not septic, make sure they're not got pyonephritis. Send an MSU and dip, even if the patient is symptomatic with a negative <coughs> urine dipstick, make sure you send an MSU because you can have a UTI which has a negative urine dip. Trimethoprim 200 milligrams, VD for three days is your bog standard treatment, treats 98% of all UTIs. Nitro, amoxicillin, trimethoprim, sulfur, methoxazole for more resistant types of bugs. People in the elderly have had repeated UTIs, you'll be having to, you'll be treating them. You'll get the MSC back a few days later and they'll be trying methadone resistant. Um, yeah, men should get UTIs. If they do, you're thinking whether they have an abnormal renal tract. So a young, a case like a young male patient with repeated UTIs, he's got PJ, he's got VJ reflux, he's got scarring. You want to think, is there some sort of anatomical deformity that's causing him to get repeated infections, okay? See that on exam, get an ultrasound KEB to look for abnormalities. <coughs> okay, what is a urine dip? You may think it's pretty simple, but 
I didn't know what a few things of these were or their significance. You can tell me what the significance of bilirubin or urobilinogen is. Or a urobilinogen. Okay, yeah, not bad. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so nitrites, like, I used to try and blag it when I was a messenger. I didn't know where there's nitrites, didn't know where there's nitrates. So, I had to look this up. Okay, it's basically, it basically shows there's E. coli in urine because E. coli converts nitrates to nitrites. Leukocytes, general inflammation. Doesn't spe spe specifically mean a UTI, but it can indicate either some renal problem or it can indicate an infection that's not coliform. Okay? Specific gravity, really useful. It tells you the hydration status of a patient quickly. If you've got a low specific gravity, like 1.0, 1.0 is water, like distilled water. So the higher that number, right, the more concentrated it is. It's 1.6, you're going to concentrate the urine. The lower the number, like 1.1, it's going to be quite dilute. So if you, you know, if you don't know really about the hydration state of a patient, just do a dip, specific gravity. Okay. Urethritis, yeah. Bog standard question on exams should be easy points. If you see this, you know, guys, young males. Painful urination, urethritis, it's going to be an STI. Gonococcal chlamydia, PCR, Pomachase reaction. Don't have to do any of those funny like swabs down the penis anymore. Just take a urine sample, do a PCR on them. Why these drugs? Why did you give plethroxin? Yeah. Chlamydia? Doxy azithromycin. Azithromycin is the drug of choice now, because it's a one-off stat dose. Why do you give? Uh, you have to give a azithromycin, which is, you know, a synthetic macrolide, because chlamydia is an obviously intracellular bug, so it has to live in cells. So the penetration of antibiotics to get to these bugs is pretty tough. Okay? It used to be doxy for days, and I just give a one dose of azithromycin. Cancers. Sorry, you yeah. know, how do you take the urethritis with percentage? Is it just like, does it come up with a discharge as well? So urethritis is, um, you can have a urethritis, just painful urination, to dysuria on urination. You can have a discharge with these as well. You don't have to have it. You can have non-specific urethritis. So, any any guesses? Lung cancer. Bladder cancer, yeah, bladder cancer, because it's urology, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so, leather worker, aniline dyes, yeah? Aniline dyes, petroleum workers, hydrocarbon exposure, aromatic hydrocarbons. Painless hematuria is your barn door answer for cancer in urology. Shortness of breath, why, why shortness of breath? Mets, Mets. Mets, yeah, two lungs, what do you say, I think? Really likes bone, okay? So you can get bone marrow infiltrates with this. So you've got low hemoglobin, white cell, platelets, right? So <coughs> pretty, pretty self explanatory bloods. So all people with painless hematuria, it's cancer till proven otherwise. That should be going through your heads when you read these questions. It'll be obvious. It'll be 50 year olds, 60 year olds who come with painless hematuria. Leather, clothes, dye workers, petroleum workers, aniline dyes. Smokers, high risk. It's an adenocarcinoma from tubular epithelium. It spreads everywhere. If you catch it in time, you have a decent survival rate. You chop the kidney out. If you don't, it's not good. I, I appreciate I'm being recorded here. So. Bladder cancer, most common urological cancer. It's a transitional cell carcinoma. Do not put a squamous cell carcinoma in your family. Squamous cell carcinoma, I only found some obscure question when I was doing like USM leaves on it. It was like some worm that infiltrated the bladder and schistosomiasis, that's it, yeah, and uh, caused bladder cancer, all with repeated stones that cause irritation and squamous cell cancers. Okay, just choose transitional cell carcinoma. Okay, terps, cystoscopy with some intracystic chemotherapy, so they'll give like six or seven doses of chemo into the bladder to remove any residual cancer. <coughs> Prostates, BPH, it's hypertrophy, it's not hyperplasia, okay? 
how do you know which is which in exams? You know, they, they, are, they sound so similar. Look for a PSA. <coughs> PSA will only go up in cancer. PSA of 100 I saw the other day, and they bad news, the guy had mets everywhere. PSA in that range, you're going to have mets. Okay, it's a, almost like a default. In terms of symptoms for BPH, these are the hallmarks. Hesitancy, poor stream, really common. If you just scream for these when you're next barking a patient, like, it's going to be all the time when, it, when you get over 65. Not, not a good prognosis for me. Dribbling, retention, snail urine smell, because these people can't really pee, so they pee over themselves. This is your, this is your guide for a, for, a, for a BPH. Smooth, large prostate, palpable, medium sulci, normal bilateral lobes of the prostate. Never felt it in my life. Um, Give them tamsulosin to reduce the size and a transurethral resection of the prostate. So TERP is your surgical treatment, tamsulosin is your medical treatment. Tamsulosin is an alpha-1 blocker and it will cause smooth muscle shrinkage and relaxation of all the... Finasteride will cause a shrinkage and tamsulosin will cause relaxation. Prostate cancer, most common male cancer. That means half of it is metastatic on presentation. As I said, people who are asymptomatic and they've got bony mets, <coughs> and they're getting atraumatic fractures, hard, craggy prostate, <coughs> sclerotic lesions. You know, if you see this, an 80 year old man who comes in having fractured the neck of his humerus um, randomly and he can't move it, uh, and you, you do some blood tests and he shows a low hemoglobin, you're thinking infiltrates. The next thing you want to be doing is doing a PR and checking your PSA. Okay? Treatment, radiotherapy, take the prostate out, put a little seed in of radio, radioactive stuff and hope to kill it from the inside. Okay, so that was that. Now, the, the interesting, the useful stuff that I want to impart on you from my horrible four months of surgical on call, right? You're going to do a surgical job. Surgical jobs are pretty. Um, you know, they're pretty intense. They, they, because surgeons want to operate, yeah? They want to be in theatre, they want to be um, operating. They don't want to be really on the ward seeing the people that they did operate on, okay? So you're going to, you know, this is your standard, standard on call. You have a high turnover of patients. It's not like medicine where you'll be sitting on patients for six weeks recovering from a stroke with an aspiration pneumonia. You know, people who come in with a perf, you fix the perf, they get septic, you fix that, they go home, the next day so you'll be in there with a the gallbladder. So, stuff you will see, okay? In your first day on call, you will see this stuff. My first ever prescription was 100 milligrams of morphine QDS. That was not your paracetamol or bag of saline, I promise you. Pretty scary. Renal failure, you will see this all the time, okay? Because you have patients who are young, they have third space losses from their surgery, they bled, they got septic, you're going to see this, okay? So we'll talk about that and how to treat that, because that's common. Hyperkalemia, you guaranteed to see this in your first week on call, okay? Everyone's like, I remember med school, I was like, oh God, you know, hyperkalemia really scared me, you know, because of all the implications that it can have on your heart. But it's not too bad, okay? Pain management, really useful. Because this is a neurology talk, I'm not going to talk about all of these, but pain management, yeah? Top tip, if you get to really see somebody, you know how we taught WHO pain ladder? Use your bit of your judgment, use it in proportion. If a patient has got a peritonitic abdomen, do not start them on paracetamol codeine, yeah? Your best bet is just to whack them with some IV morphine, get on top of the pain, and then sort them out from there. That's my best tip. Trambol also, <coughs> if they're young or small, 50 milligrams QDS. If they're big, more a man, essentially, give them 100 milligrams QDS. It's a great pain relief. The nurses hate giving morphine on the wards, IV morphine, but it works quickly and you can give it and you will get on top of it and you will save yourself a hell of a lot of bleeps, okay? Sepsis, you know that, you've had a lot of lecture on it and you've been taught well at vet school about it, I won't half on about that. <coughs> Cute LVF, really scary, right? Really scary. You'll get called to see people, flash, I can't breathe, I had a double amputee on the wards who couldn't breathe, was short of breath, sat to like 78%, just heard crackles over the chest, and I was like, oh, this must be LVF. And freezer mic, 40 milligrams, 
sacks went up to 98% like 20 minutes later. Very good. This is really satisfying. <laughs> Cute abdomen. Perks. I put this at the end because just to highlight a really horrible experience. Like surgery protocols, I said, they can be quite isolating. You know, at med school, you're taught like call for help. Yeah? So I called for help when I had a patient who was parasitic and my SHO was like, couldn't reach him. My reg, I went up to the theatre and I said, I think I've got this patient who's parasitic. And they said, can't you see him in the middle of doing something? I was like, all right, okay. So went back in, gave him 30 milligrams of iron morphine, wheeled him up to theatre myself. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, okay, true story, okay, true story. <laughs> Nine-year-old, demented, blind man admitted from a nursing home with delirium. I cried at the end of this night, I, I fool you not. He pulled out five grey cannulas I'd put in. You've been called because his blood pressure has gone from 120 over 80 to 80 over 40, okay? Your app is nil. Observations. Now see here, these are not like your barn door exam style questions. These are like your sort of middling obs, aren't they? You're thinking, eh, they're not too bad, like sat's alright, temperature's alright, yeah? But they're not so great, so you're in the sort of grade ground, what, what do you do? So I checked the bloods, obviously they were, he came in overnight, so I did these, I hadn't done these bloods, no one had checked them, and I come up with this, you know, really bad renal failure, urine output nil. Your output on surgery is your best observation, okay? It will save you time and again. Half a mil per kilo per hour, right? If you do that, you need to be aiming for like 25 <coughs> to 30 mils per kilo, 25 to 30 mils an hour, and you'll be all right. It's more useful, I found, than any of the other ops, okay? Because it tells you organ perfusion, yeah? Renal failure. How, take control of the situation, yeah? Your doctors, you're gonna have to like, sort it out. Even though, you know, you'll be F1s, you will have to take control of the situation. This is an urgent situation. You've got a deteriorating patient, even though he's 19 with loads of comorbidities. Where's the, he's got AKI, it's obvious. Where is the problem? Is the patient dry? Is the patient septic? Your pre-renal causes. Is it renal? I have no idea. I'm not a, you know, a renal physician and I don't have a biopsy. So it's really going to be one of these two. Easy. post I love post -renal. It's very easy to treat. So, plan of action. Drip down, drip up, tube down, put a one and a half piece of Volplex into an old guy. I was very worried because you taught, you know, LVF, but it worked. I just kept pumping up fluid, and I'm not joking when I say, like, horrible, thick, greeny urine came out of his catheter. And this is, he was septic, he had urosepsis, right? So he had a mixed pre-renal and post-renal failure. Catheter sorted him out. One and a half litres of Volplex sorted his pre-renal out. And uh, yeah, so it was a very nice, nice resolution. Little tips on pre-renal, right? Urea in exams, you're going to see the urea will be like 30 <coughs> and creatinine will be like 120. Okay, when the urea is really disproportionate, never happens in real life, but when it's really disproportionately high compared to the creatinine, you know it's pre-renal because your renal tubules are reabsorbing. Imagine like that fluid is spending more time in the kidney, so it's reabsorbing more of that urea. Okay. Pre-renal, I won't go on too much about that. You know, we all know the causes. Renal. You know, you use things drug induced. I saw a guy who took an overdose of uh, ibuprofen, 28 to 400 milligram tablets, and he got drug induced interstitial arthritis when it flash. So, case six. And again, another case of middling sorts of bloods. 50 or 6 year old chap, day three post Whipple's. Hemoglobin is that a big operation, yeah? White cells and platelets. High, somebody said? They're okay. What do you make of the, the renal function? Hyperkalemia? <coughs> Sodium? <coughs> would, you, would, you, would you be worried about it? Gentleman in the structure? Yes. Yes! Okay, so what would you be doing for this? You're at a little computer on the ward somewhere. Uh, well, I got a 
assassin. Okay. Find out his two status. Like, yes. Find out his. Yeah, so you're going for that whole eubulemic, hypovolemic, hypovolemic thing. I think that's legit. I, I wouldn't really do much about that personally. I'd be more worried about the potassium, but obviously it's the urology talk, so you can kind of guess what's coming up. What do you think about the LSTs? Raised. Okay, yeah, so you've got a deranged, you've got a transaminitis here, you've got a deranged ALT. Alkaline phosphatase is all right. Bilirubin's fine. Okay, the guy's had a whiffles. May have fiddled about with his liver. May have irritated that. It's going to be normal. But these are the sort of bloods you will be faced with. Like they don't fit patterns. They don't. They're all kind of messed up. But you need to catch the stuff that's important here. That you need to sort out there and then as a house officer, right? Hyperkalemia. Do do not panic. I was dead scared, right? This sort of stuff is, is nice to mention, you know, in exams or vivas or whatever, but it's not really going to fix the problem there and then. If you take somebody's spironolactin off, they're not going to get another dose for like 24 hours, are they? So these, we have these nice little cards that they give us. They're very useful. Uh, we have a fat book of them, and I just took these two off because these were the only ones I found useful. One is minerals and electrolytes, and the other is sepsis. Okay? So for this, you don't have to do anything. Potassium of six, do nothing. Okay? Counterintuitive, but don't do anything. Above seven, you need sorting out. Six to seven, right? Do an ECG. You're looking for? Exactly. Tall I didn't mean to hit the death. Tall tented T waves. Salbutamol. Why salbutamol? How much salbutamol? 10 milligrams. 10 milligrams nebulized, yeah. Insulin dextrose. Insulin drives stuff intracellularly, <coughs> dextrose to stop them having a hypo. Okay, note that there is no calcium glutamate here. Everyone sort of jumps to that in exams, don't they? Okay, you will probably, if you get this question in an exam, it will be a really big potassium. So over seven, you're going to go in calcium glutamate for the cardioprotective effect on stabilizing the myocardium. Okay, and last, not least, ah, oh, fail. So get good at your cannulas now, and when you're shadowing and doing electives. Because now you know when you go off and do a cannula, it's like, you know, that's it. But when you're, you know, when you're an F1, there'll be no one else, and you can't do your stuff unless you can cannulate. And it's not like cannulating antecubital fossa veins or here. You know, you're gonna have to be cannulating like thready old people's hands, and sometimes there will be no one else. There will be no one else to call for help. So if you can get good at them now, get confident, do that. On nights, aim to get all your invasive procedures done before midnight. Okay, that means all your bloods, all your cannulas, get them done before midnight. Because then the lights will go off, you will have to wake the patients up, which they hate, and you'll be going around the wards with this like little pen torch doing your bloods and cannulas, and it's really not cool, <laughs> okay? Although it's probably not very uh, correct in terms of your contract, aim to get asleep. I love having a sleep on this, because it gives me something to work towards. It's really motivational. <laughs> Learn to be autonomous. As I said before, there will be times where it will just be you, and even though you're taught to call for help, you will have to take charge and do stuff on your own. And you all do it, you will, you, you know, I cannot believe, like, I mean, you know, it doesn't feel like I've been working for six months, but, yeah. Sick patients, this means, say, sick patients trump other things. Nurses will call you for an urgent EDAN, an urgent discharge, or you will get told to urgently do some non-urgent job. Remember, the sick patients, if you leave them doing an EDAN, half an hour, a lot can happen. And you will find half an hour goes, an hour goes, an hour and a half. And if I had, like, left that... Nine-year-old, you would be dead. Trust your instincts. You'll have nurses telling you you're drowning the patient. You're killing them. <laughs> giving them. Yeah, I've had that said to me, like giving them 500 mils of Volplex, which goes on to this. 500 mils, yeah, is a can of is a bottle of Coke. This changed my thinking. We had an F1 teaching this by a renal doctor. It's only a can of Coke. When you see people giving 250 mil boluses of fluid, that's like taking a Coke can. Take out two 20ml syringes, it's actually not a lot. 
And then I put a little devil in me like, when I was at med school, I could do this in four seconds. <laughs> Why would you give somebody this over half an hour when they're septic and dying? You know what I mean? It's not actually that much. <laughs> okay, so, yeah. thank you very much.